नमस्ते वेलकम बैक हरे कृष्णा थैंक यू सो इनटू द भक्ति सेक्शन ऑफ द भगवत गीता लेट अस प्रेड कृष्णा दैट एज ही रिवील्स हिज हार्ट टू अस इन द भगवत गीता दैट वी कैन आल्सो ओपन आवर हार्ट टू रिसीव एंड रिलिश हिज रिवेलेशन So now, when Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita, the Gita, at one level, is is visible. Color has changed. The Gita is a natural conversation. It is not exactly a structured education there is a structure within it but the gita itself is a natural conversation that means when krishna is speaking the bhagavad gita at that time he doesn't say atah panchamo adhyaya purnam atah saptadasho adhyaya he is not speaking in terms of chapters he is just having a normal discussion and as topics come up he addresses those topics so when krishna starts the bhagavad gita he is not giving us a technical analysis of karma yoga gyan yoga bhakti yoga it's like you can have a subject you can have a educational class about physics then in that class you may have uh, the teacher Uh, speak okay we'll discuss this subject now we'll discuss this subject now we'll discuss this subject now so it is not exactly like a uh, educational class to give a contemporary example the gita is actually like a podcast <laughs> you know <laughs> when you have this podcast discussions two people come and they have a earnest discussion and it's not a arbitrary discussion they are discussing seriously on some topic but it is also as the discussion flows they have the discussion it's not a pre scripted discussion you can have a scripted interview for 5 minutes 7 minutes but it's a 2 hour podcast it cannot be scripted so the gita is not in that sense like a scripted discussion so as subjects come up krishna discusses those subjects and now when subjects come up how do subjects come up one is arjuna asks some questions second is that krishna has explained something and krishna takes it forward from there so there are some places where a new chapter begins with with arjuna asking a question which signifies that and now the discussion is going in a particular direction some places krishna himself starts a new theme and that indicates okay now we are going in a particular direction so actually from 7.1 the very first word of 7.1 begins with a very distinct focus it is mai asakta manaha asakta is attached till now the entire focus of the gita is being on being detached and suddenly krishna is saying now the focus is not being detached the focus is being attached so of course the attachment is to krishna so it's a divine attachment but still the focus is shifting till the sixth chapter when krishna is talking about karma yoga the focus has been on being taktwa karma phalam se phalam phal karma phal taktwa karma phala ya sangam taktwa like that give up attachment give up be detached be equipoised but here the very first verse is mai asakt mana and this actually to talk about from the conceptual flow i said that i'm not doing a very much of a a chapter wise or we are all the going to chapter wise we are not going to chapter so much we are going to concepts more so what has happened is in one sense in chapters 1 to or 2 to 6 as i said 
till chapters 2 to 5 was karma yoga then chapter 5 to 6 was dhyan yoga but dhyan yoga krishna culminates it in bhakti yoga because 647 what was that among all yogis the one who fixes their mind on me is the most united with me so now what krishna is essentially saying is i have described to you the path from karma yoga to gyan yoga to bhakti yoga not dhyan, dhyan yoga dhyan yoga to bhakti yoga no, uh, to, to not bhakti yoga specifically to fixing the mind only which is the ultimate yogic perfection now i will give you an alternative pathway mai asaktavana now i will give you an alternative pathway by which you can make your mind fixed only so the six the seven point one is a very key transition verse sometimes in a class if a speaker is speaking and say okay we'll discuss this topic now now we'll move to this topic so it's a transition point like that so this is a transition point and what is the transition point here krishna is saying mai asakta manha part let's look at this verse we'll recite it and then we will Look at this transition point. So, Shri Bhagavan Vacha, Maya Sattamana Partha, Yogam Yunjan Madashraya, Asam Shayam Samagramma. Yatha Gyansya Sita Shrunu So Krishna is telling here that this is the that mind attached to me that was the perfection that was talked about in 647 and through the path of yoga Arjuna has said this is very difficult now Krishna is saying I will give you another path by which you can attain the perfection of yoga. And what are the stages in that? He says it begins with here. You hear what I am going to speak to you. Shru, that's Shru. You hear, what will, what is if you hear what will happen, you will know me. Gyansya si. How will you know me? Free from doubt. Now, once you know me, free from doubt, you will practice yoga devoted to me. Yogam Yunjan. And what is the purpose of this yoga? It is to take shelter of me. Madashraya. And when you take shelter of me, eventually what will happen is, you will make your mind attached to me. So Krishna will describe the pathway by which anyone in this world can grow spiritually and make their mind attached to Krishna. So here, you come to know about me, you come to know about me, you become free from doubts about me, then oh, Krishna is such a wonderful person. I want to connect with him. I want to practice yoga to connect with him. Now, and not just connect with him, I want to take shelter of him. And then our mind becomes completely focused on him. So this particular journey we can visualize in another way, which as you get the sequence, I'll explain it further. See, the idea is that if we consider the spiritual journey, say, at the start of the spiritual journey, somebody who is a starter on the spiritual path. See, for them, the world is big and God is small. That means, okay, God exists, but what really matters is the world. When I was introduced to Bhakti, I tried to share Bhagavad Gita wisdom with some of my relatives. So my uncle said, I believe in God. He is happy there, I am happy here. <laughs> so, the idea is, okay, even if God exists, God doesn't matter. 
but as we become seers as we go spiritually the world becomes smaller and god becomes bigger for us so what does it mean the world becomes smaller that the world's ups and downs yeah they will come and go but my connection with god as long as i am connected with god as long as i am devoted to god as long as i am trying to please god that is what really matters in my life so this is essentially the spiritual journey that initially god is just like a uh, you could say somebody is uh, driving a car then god is like the spare wheel you know spare wheel means if things don't work out then you pray to god hmm? god is like the spare wheel i saw an advertisement of an insurance company if you don't have insurance with us it's time for you to start your prayers <laughs> so <laughs> the idea is yeah if nothing else works go to god okay that's also good sometime people are going to god but at this level god is not our spare wheel he is our steering wheel no he is the same. it is he who is the primary reality for us it is he who guides us so when i earlier said that you know we can live with pain or live in pain so if our if the world is very big for us anything goes wrong in the world then we will live in pain but if god is the bigger reality for us then if something goes wrong in the world it will still matter for us but it won't matter that much because the lord is the bigger reality that's how the, the we may live here we may live in pain but at this stage here we will live if there is problem we will live in pain but when god is the bigger reality for us and even if there is pain sorry even if there is pain we will live with pain not in pain so the whole process of spiritual growth is that we make god the bigger reality so when krishna is saying mai asakta manaha that means god is the biggest reality for us say if then we have a family and for earning for our family we have to take a job far away from our family then we we have to do our job we have to deal with clients customers various people but in the in the back of our mind it's all this we are doing for our family so that is what is prominent in our mind although what is prominent may not be in the forefront of our mind all the time it may be okay if i have to deal with my customers i have to deal with the customers i have to pay attention to them but why am i doing all this it's for taking care of my family so in that sense when our attachment to krishna is very strong we may do various activities in the world but we won't be affected by those activities because we are primarily focused on connecting with krishna and staying connected with krishna so krishna is telling now i will describe you the process by which you will come to know me and knowing me you will become devoted to me and i will become the biggest reality for you that's how my asakta mana the mind will become attached to him so this in one sense this process krishna describes from chapter 7 till chapter 12 so he describes it in various ways at various places but essentially he is describing this in these six chapters so now generally speaking when people turn towards spirituality people pursue spiritual growth they pursue spiritual growth for two distinct reasons one is they see spirituality as a shock absorber and second is they see spirituality as a goal transformer shock absorber and goal transformer shock absorber means that in life there is so much stress there is so much anxiety there is so much trouble i want some peace of mind so in when krishna talks about in seven 
16, he talks about four kinds of people who come to me. So the first three categories, those who are distressed, those who are wealth seekers, and those who are curious. For them, God is more like a shock absorber. That, oh, I've got some shocks, I just want relief from them. And it's good. Krishna says even such people are, they are udaraha. They are, they are so large-hearted that they come to me. In fact, this word udaraha, udaraha sarva evaite, Krishna says, it's a very striking word. He uses this in 717, I believe. So it's, is it 717 or 718? Does anyone have the Gita here? So anyway, one of these verses. So he speaks this. So, but anyway, Ramanacharya gives a very beautiful commentary to this verse. Mm, 717. No. 18, yeah. So, Udara Sarva Udara, actually in our normal language, it means charitable. Prabhupada is large hearted. Now, if we consider what is Udara over here, see, if God is here and say we are here, now we are going to God because we want something from him. So in one sense we are self-seeking. So if we are self-seeking and still Krishna is saying, oh you are so charitable. Udaraha sarvevaiti. So normally it is the giver who is considered charitable, not the asker. How can the asker be charitable? But he explains that Krishna loves us so much that Krishna wants wants our love. Krishna wants us to love him. He is so eager, he is so hungry for our love that for whatever reason we come to him. He is happy that we come to him. He is happy. Just like no, if a child has become estranged from the parents and then the child gets into a lot of trouble and finally the child comes to the parents for help. Now if the parents love the child, the parents are not going to ask. Mm. No, no. It's only when you are in trouble you are coming to you know, when, only when you are in trouble you are coming to me. The parents are going to say, if you are in so much trouble, why didn't you come to me earlier? It's good that you came to me. So like that Krishna is saying, you come to me, Udara. He's happy. So to give another example, say suppose a boy proposes to a girl. Please marry me. And the girl asks, okay, why do you want us to marry? And the boy says, because no other girl in town is ready to marry me. <laughs> <laughs> That is not the most romantic of proposals, isn't it? <laughs> but, say, if the girl accepts that proposal, that shows her love for him, not his love for her. Isn't it? I mean, the girl really loves that boy, even if she is her last alternative, still she is ready to accept him. So like that, Krishna is saying, even if I am your last alternative, at least you are coming to me, However, if the boy is to show his love for the girl, then over a period of time, she has to become his first alternative. So like that, initially, when we are on the spiritual journey, we, we face problems, we think, okay, money will solve my problems, contacts will solve my problems, my own cleverness will solve my problems. And when nothing else works, let's go to God. Why will come to me? Oh God, I've tried everything else, nothing else worked, please help me. He says, thank you that you came to me, Krishna says. So that is nice, but eventually Krishna needs to become our first choice, not our last choice. So basically, going back to this diagram, when I say initially the world is big and God is small. So here what happens basically is that for us God is the means. 
and the world is the end that means the real thing is i want to be happy in this world i want power i want comfort i want success and god you be a means to that so this is where we see god as a goal as a shock absorber i have already decided what i want but i am having difficulty in getting it so god you please help me to get it it's okay at least we are coming to god for that however as we evolve spiritually we start understanding that actually the world is a means to god that god is actually the end that the world whatever wealth i have whatever relationships i have whatever talents i have they are all meant for the service of god so this is pure devotion and krishna says normally this may take many lifetimes so this is where god and spirituality becomes our goal transport initially i come because i'm so stressed i want to be peaceful so that i can go on enjoying my life in the world but after some time i realize enjoying my life in the world is not that great there is there some higher higher satisfaction in life is there something which gives greater fulfillment that is what i seek so this normally takes multiple lifetimes krishna says let's recite this verse bahunam janma namante ज्ञानवान मां प्रपद्यते ज्ञानवान मां प्रपद्यते वासुदेव सर्वमिति वासुदेव सर्वमिति समहात्मा सुदुर्लभा समहात्मा सुदुर्लभा सो हियर व्हाट कृष्ण इज एसेंशियली सेइंग इज दैट वासुदेव सर्वमिति दैट मींस कृष्ण वासुदेव इज द अल्टीमेट रियलिटी ही इज द बिगर रियलिटी फॉर अस and he is the purpose of our life that's where the world is not the end but the world is a means to the end and this is where our devotion becomes very steady and stable otherwise if god is just a means to the end of the world so today i pray to god to get something in the world but tomorrow if i can get those things without god then thank you god goodbye it becomes like that so then the devotion remains very unsteady so krishna is saying that yes many people will approach him most of them will come because they want some kind of shock absorption in life but eventually it's that those who see krishna as the goal they are very rare so it's like if we have a funnel those who are seeking those who come to god those who come to spirituality as a shock absorber they will be many those who seek god as the ultimate goal the goal transformer they will be very rare manushyana sahasrishu among thousands of people few will come to me many people face problems but most people do not turn to god they may turn to to well to power through to movies to dark drugs to intoxication people try so many things to deal with their problems to get away from their problems a few come to god but even after a few come to god kashchit yatha tam api siddhana kashchin mam vetti tatvata a few actually come to know that i am the ultimate goal of my life of life so in the seventh chapter basically what krishna is telling is why mai asakta mana why should we make our mind attached to him because he is the supreme reality it is he who is the supreme source of satisfaction therefore try to become attached to him then after this so i'll just speak one or two key points from each of the chapters of the gita so chapter 7 we discuss two points now chapter 8 krishna is doing two things in chapter 8 among many things one is he is comparing dhyan yoga and bhakti yoga so why is in this for sixth chapter he had talked about dhyan yoga and there arjuna had said this is difficult but krishna had given a non specific recommendation that abhyas and vairagya that persistence and abstinence but you could say like if somebody is taking a treatment 
know, allopathy or Ayurveda or naturopathy or whatever kind of treatment, like persistence and abstinence are universal principles in any treatment. So Krishna gives non-specific recommendations over there. So then in this chapter, he will say that, okay, you can fix your mind on me by the process of Dhyan Yoga. That's also possible. Om Ittika, Aksharam Brahma, he says, you can chant Om and Ma Manu Smaran, you can remember him. But there's only one verse in the Gita where Krishna says, attaining me as the ultimate reality is easy. That is in 8.14. And that is Krishna's answer to Arjuna's question. Okay, this path of Dhyan Yoga is difficult. Krishna says that, I recommend Bhakti Yoga. Ananya Chetaha Satatam Yoma Smarati Nityashaha Yoma Smarati Nityashaha Tasyaham Sulabha Partha Nitya Yuktasya Yoginaha So one who practices fixing their mind on me, for that person Sulabha I am easily attained. So what just now we discussed the word 719 is Durlabha. Right? That is very difficult to attain. But Krishna says that is very difficult to attain, that is one among millions attains, that is easy if one practices Bhakti Yoga. Means practices fixing the mind on me. Then one can attain that. So uh, now why is practicing Bhakti Yoga easy as compared to Dhyan Yoga? That's primarily for two reasons. Now when people talk about meditation, they talk about it in two things, two ways, you know. It's the mode of thinking and the object of thought. That means somebody may say that mode of thinking, oh, I'm meditating on this subject. I'm meditating on how to whether to go ahead with this relationship or not, whether to take this job or not. Meditating means it's deep thinking. So one meaning of the word meditation is based on the mode of thinking. And the other, so this is often you could say in the no normal or daily sense. If people use the word, I'm, I'm meditating on the subject. That means I'm thinking deeply about it. Now in the spiritual or the philosophical sense, Meditation is based primarily on the object of meditation. You say, I am practicing meditation. So, okay, I am meditating on an image of Krishna, I am meditating on this mantra. You say, I am meditating on, the, on this light, I am meditating on this, I am meditating. So, there the focus is on the object of meditation. So, uh, in the spiritual context, the object of meditation is the most important thing. How we meditate is also important, but the object of meditation is most important. So with respect to if somebody decides to meditate, so if we focus on the object, now the object can be either passive or the object can be active or even attractive. What do I mean by this? See, if somebody decides, okay, you know, I sit in the room and there's a white board over there and that white board there's a black dot and I meditate on the black dot. Okay, any way we try to calm our mind, it's helpful because the mind is agitated, calm our mind. Somebody says, okay, I will meditate on this, on the flame of this candle. They can meditate on that. But that is a passive object. Uh, I may put all my meditation on the flame of the candle. But the flame of the candle is not a person who is going to love me. The point on a wall is not something which is going to offer any mercy or grace to me. So basically, meditating on Krishna is easier because Krishna is not a passive object that you are meditating on. He is both active and attractive. Attractive means because he is attractive, our mind easily goes towards him. Krishna has so many sweet names, Krishna has so many delightful pastimes, Krishna, there are so many songs, there is a whole bhakti culture 
with music dance literature song architecture there are so many ways in which you can fix our mind on krishna so krishna is attractive and attractive and krishna is also active active in the sense that krishna is capable of being merciful like earlier i gave the example of bhagavad gita and bollywood now there in when in that example it is we who have to consciously choose bhagavadgita.com but when we try to fix the mind on krishna it is not just we who are trying to push our mind towards krishna it is krishna also who is trying to draw our mind towards us krishna will talk about is later in the 12th chapter also tesham aham samuddhata i will lift you out of this ocean of material existence i will raise you up how quickly achirat not very fast so krishna is not a passive point he is active and he is attractive and because of that meditating on him is much easier now ultimately even in the path of yoga people come to krishna but it is after a long time initially it says bruvor madhye pranam aveshya samyak initially on the path of yoga if somebody is following that path they don't know what is the ultimate reality they start by some fixed point of concentration it could be the eyebrows the space between the eyebrows it could be the uh, tip of the nasika gramswam tip of the nose they take any point and try to focus on that and then gradually by that go inward inward inwards till eventually they realize that vishnu is the lord within the heart and the greatest yogi is dhyana avasthita tadgate na manasa pashyanti am yogi no they'll come to that gradually but it's a long laborious process because we are starting from a passive point of concentration and then gradually move towards a active and attractive point but when we start right from the active or the attractive point then it becomes much easier so meditation on krishna is easier because he is a active and attractive point of focus of is a person whom we are meditating on now the second point i'll talk about is that <clears throat> this is a question when i am whenever i am doing a, whenever i am in america and you talk the bhagavad gita many people say that the eastern philosophy is very world denying it is very world rejecting it is very pessimistic and one of the verses that are quoted for this is the just the next verse after this most of us many of you know this verse the key line over is dukhale ashashtam this world is a place of distress now when people hear this just feel you are being so pessimistic this world is a place of distress and they find that this is a very world denying or world rejecting kind of philosophy but is the bhagavad gita pessimistic well, why no because we are following the bhagavad gita <laughs> no we look at it so is the gita pessimistic i look at it from three different perspectives the contextual the textual and the philosophical so contextual means in the context of the gita now we know that at the start of the gita arjuna was distressed didn't it and in the middle of the gita we know arjuna is still in 2.1 he is saying tam tatha krupaya avishtam ashru purna kulekshan he is in tears now in 8.15 in this verse krishna is telling this world is a place of distress so krishna could have said arjuna you are in distress this world is a place of distress therefore the bhagavad gita is true now stay in anapi stay in distress that is not what krishna is doing the gita goes on from here and by the end of the gita if we come to 1873 actually arjuna has become distress free nashto moha smutir labdha tvat prasadan mayachuta he says by your mercy o krishna 
my illusion is dispelled, my doubts are gone, and sthitos me gata sandhya, I become well situated, I become composed. So, it's interesting, although Gita says the world is a place of distress, Arjuna, the Gita takes Arjuna from being distressed to be free from distress. So the Gita's message is clearly not pessimistic in the sense that this world is a place of distress, all of you stay distressed. That's not the message of the Gita. Now, if we look at it, this is the contextual. Contextual means that if we look at the context, what is happening to Arjuna? He is being freed from distress. Now, if we look at the textual, in this verse, Krishna is not really emphasizing that this world is a place of distress. It's not even one verse. It is, if you consider this verse, it's, it's one fourth of one verse. We consider verse as four parts A, B, C, D. It's only one fourth that is talking about it. What is the emphasis of the verse? That those who worship me, they will attain me and they won't come to this world of distress. They won't come to this world of distress again. So the focus is not that this or that the world is a place of distress. The focus is to go beyond this world of distress. To go to, they will attain me. So clearly, the emphasis is on transcending distress, not on staying in distress because the, the world is a place of distress. Mm -hmm. So now, what does this mean? This leads this textual leads to the philosophical. The philosophical is going to be the biggest part of it. And you know, if you forget everything else from this three session or uh, the six session, seven, three, four days course that we are having, if you remember this one diagram, you know, you will be remembering the most important parts of the message of the Gita. One of the most important parts. See, basically, this four quadrant, like this world and another world, or the other world. So broadly, the various philosophies in this world, this world is real, the other world is real. So this world is unreal, the other world is unreal. So if we have, if we can make four quadrants like that, all the philosophies in the world can be put broadly within these four categories. Not necessarily in the specific details, but broadly. So that there is this world we live in and there is another world beyond this. Now, if we had a time machine by which we went about 300, 400 years before, before the scientific revolution started in the West, then whether it's India or the West or the Middle East or Native America or even Native Australia, I have there, been there and talked with some of the devotees who are from Native Australia, uh, tribes in Australia, they call them the first people. Almost everyone had this understanding that there is another world and that world is the ultimate destination. Hmm? The Bible later said this world is like a bridge. Don't build your own over it, cross over it. So that theme is there everywhere. But after science and the scientific revolution, we started claiming that this whole idea of another world, a paradise, a heaven, a spiritual world, it's all a myth. And the idea became, this world is the only world. So, the current philosophy is that this world is real, the other world is unreal. So, we could call this as materialism. So, we'll call this one, these four quadrants, one, two, three, and four. So, this is the prevailing philosophy mostly in the world. This world is all that exists and there's nothing beyond this world. And if this is the philosophical presumption that somebody is having, this world is the only world. And then if you say this world is a place of distress, then people feel, what is the point of living also? Isn't it if? That means there is no possibility for any kind of improvement in my life. There is no possibility for anything becoming better. 
So, but that is not the point of the Gita. The Gita is never saying that we can't have a better life. <coughs> so, this philosophical world, this world is the only world that is real. Now, we are not going to go into extensive critique of these philosophies, but just a quick couple of points. The problem with the idea that this world is the only real world. The problem is that this world is at the very least, it is dissatisfying. That there's never enough of what we want. You know, I am not, uh, I'm not uh, tall enough, I'm not fair enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not slim enough, I'm not rich enough. There's never enough of what we have. And at the very least, we stay dissatisfied. And even within materialism, through technology, we have tried to convert this world into a tech paradise. In fact, that was the promise of technology. That through whatever discomfort is there world, is there in this world, through technology will remove the discomfort. It's too hot or too cold, we will have air conditioning or we will have heaters. We will remove distress. And in many ways, technology has removed much of the physical distress. But what has happened is, still, People are in distress. Maybe physically we are comfortable, but the level of the mind, there are so many problems. So we have tried to create a tech paradise, but the result of that is we are comfortably miserable. <laughs> <laughs> what that means is at the level of the body, we may be comfortable, but at the level of the mind, we are still miserable. In fact, mental health problems are far more than in the past. And it's, it's irony that psychologists are still grappling with. In the past, life was much tougher. And yet people didn't seem to have so much mental health problems. Now, life is relatively, at least at the physical level, it's much easier. Very few of us live uh, with the fear that some tiger is going to pounce on us and eat us. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, very few of us live in the fear that a snake is going to bite us and kill us. But still we are in distress. So the point is that our mind, it wants something bigger. I'll come to that. So another way that if the tech paradise is not working, then another way is fictional paradise. Fictional paradise means, like I earlier talked about movies. You know, for many people who become fans of some kind of movie universe, whether it is Star Wars or it is Harry Potter or this or that. I don't know what are there in India. It's like for people, these movie characters, they are in many ways more real than the ordinary reality. People have these comic cons where they wear dresses like these characters. So basically the point is, the world we live in is dissatisfying. And that's why we want to go to some other world. And entertainment, movies, these are a way to create another world. By which we go, we forget the emptiness, the boredom, the dissatisfactoriness of this world. So basically materialism has not been a very satisfactory solution. At a physical level, comfort has come up, but it has not worked. So basically, if we consider the material world, then above this, there is a spiritual world. And below this, we could say there is a fictional world. So, now we have rejected that there is no such spiritual world. So what we can try to do, we have escape from reality. We, that, in fact, people also use the word. This movie, like in a movie review, they say, this movie is great escapist entertainment. Escapist entertainment is we just forget all the world with its problems. So we basically create an alternative reality. Because the, the reality that we live in is just not satisfactory enough. Now, what spirituality says is that yes, this world is real, but there is another reality. Let's come to that. So, so this is a problematic worldview. That but this world is the other world is unreal, and even this world is unreal. That is called nihilism. 
Nihilism is basically there is no point to existence at all. And among all worldviews, this can be the darkest. So even in the last century, there are some existential philosophers, existential philosophers. They realized the falsity of the promises of technology. That technology won't provide all that it promises us. And now the idea of another world is removed. And this world is a place of distress. So what do you do? Alberto Camus, an existential philosopher, he said that, I'm paraphrasing. He said that the world is just filled with misery. And the more we try to remove misery, the worse it becomes. Therefore, the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. <laughs> it's such a dark view. You know? And the philosopher Sartre, he said that anytime I pass, I pass close to a window on a fourth or fifth story of a building, I have to fight the temptation to jump off that window. It's such a dark view of the world. Now, these were intelligent people, but unfortunately they had rejected the idea of a spiritual world. And this world with all its promises, if we reject this also as false, then what is the point of living? So nihilism is a very dark place to be in. Now, the third is that the other world is real, but this world is false. This is impersonalism. Hmm? So, impersonalism is the idea that Brahma Satya, Jagan Mitya. This whole world is false. Now, this, there is a strand of Indian philosophy that advocates this, but this is not the teaching of Indian philosophy in all of it. And this is certainly not the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, the Bhagavad Gita considers this world to be so important that when there is disorder in this world, Krishna himself descends to establish order here. And he comes not just once, but Sambhavami, Yuge, Yuge. So this world is real, this world matters. So this, so this is impersonalism. What is the problem? First is, it is not the Gita's teaching, clearly. Hmm? The Gita says that, even if they say this world is Dukkhala, it doesn't say this world is false. It says Parastasma Bhavam. It's another world. Now, the other bigger problem, apart from it not being the Gita's teaching, is that you know, this makes us very apathetic. Completely apathetic towards anything in this world. So, it is one of history's great mystery that how the Indian civilization, which was such an ancient and powerful civilization, it succumbed to invaders again and again and again. Uh, when the Islamic invaders came to India, generally it's very rare that the invading army will be bigger than the defending army. Maybe the defending army for the small kingdom is possible, but it's a big kingdom. So, but time and time again, it's not just one Islamic invader, many more, many inv invaders came and they repeatedly defeated Indian kings. Now, we can go into geopolitical reasons, and there are there is validity to those reasons. But one of the points was that in the medieval times, medieval times means see Shankaracharya appeared in the seventh century. Whatever Shankaracharya taught, subsequently the teaching became very world-denying and world-rejecting. And because of that, there was an attitude of apathy towards the world. So whoever rules, this person rules or that person rules, it doesn't make any difference. Now the Kshatriyas, many of them are not like that. But the rest of the society became quite apathetic. And even the British commented on this, that when there was a famine during the British time, he says if in, in Britain a famine like this would have happened, the masses would have risen in revolution. But he said India is just accepting it passively. I mean, this, this world is Maya, whatever happens is just going on. So, the, I, uh, one, one European philosopher, he came to India and he said that when I read about Indian philosophy, it is so lofty. When I came to India and I look at the way people live, it is so filthy. He said, I just couldn't look at this cognitive dissonance. How can people who had such lofty thoughts, the philosophical ponderings were so great, how can they live in such poverty, such filth, 
such utter apathy towards their daily way of living. Uh, one reason for that is this world rejecting philosophy. If this world is Maya, why care for this world at all? So this can have disastrous consequences. Now the Gita's teaching, it's the it's bhakti teaching. Bhakti or Gita teaching is that this world is real and the other world also is real. That this world is also an energy of God. This world exists, it, this world matters. It is not false. However, this world is not the ultimate world. There is another world that matters more. So what happens is, this is, we all, with the Gita's worldview, because this world is real, we work in this world. But we understand that our ultimate shelter is not in this world. So this is actually a life affirming. It affirms both in this life and in the next life. That we, we serve God in this world and as a service to God, we, we do our responsibilities properly. Like we consider the environment, this is the eco-village. One of the aspects of India, unfortunately, is that even the sacred places are very dirty. That people will come and worship in the temple, but when they come out of the temple, they will just strew garbage everywhere. Because what has happened is, it's almost like the sacred is disconnected from the rest of the world. But if we understand, this world has also come from God. This world also has sanctity to it. We need to take care of this world. Now, we don't have to become so obsessed with this world that we forget the other world. But this world is real and the other world also is real. So now, with this, this in mind, I was talking basically about how the Gita is not pessimistic. That when it says that this world is Dukhale, what is it trying to say? Basically, what it is saying is that when we are living in this world, distress, Distress is always going to be a part of our life experience. Whatever we do, there will always be something wrong in the world. When this, the, the Gita says this word is Dukhalaya, the word Dukhalaya, okay, still, still it is not coming, sorry. So, distress is always going to be a part of the world. So, the word Dukhalaya is like the word Himalaya. Now, if somebody goes to the Himalayas and he asks them, why have you come to the Himalayas? He says, I want to avoid feeling cold. Well, then you are in the wrong place. Yes, it is. Cold is going to be a part of the experience of being in the Himalayas. But, and if somebody starts complaining, oh, it's so cold, it's so cold, it's so cold. No, other people will say, you know, what you're saying is so old, so old, so old. Let's get over it. But does cold have to be the only experience in the Himalayas? No. You know, the Himalayas are a place of great beauty. There's natural beauties there. There is adventure. Those who want to go on trekking. There is spirituality. There is, for those who want to go and see the temples, maybe meet the sages, go to sacred places. So there are so many other things to experience over there. But we can experience all those things only when we accept that cold is going to be a part of my life, my experience over there. So like that, when the Gita is saying this whole Dukkha layer, that does not mean Dukkha has to be our only experience. But distress will always be a part of our experience. And if we focus on trying to eliminate distress, then that will only aggravate the distress. Why? Because the more we try to eliminate distress, even a small amount of distress will seem unbearable. I was in Canada, I stayed at one devotee's house. 
So the husband is a businessman, but he also does marriages. He's a priest who learns marriages. And his wife is in family law. Now family law is just a euphemism, a polite word for she's a divorce attorney. So they say we are a poor couple. You come to the husband to get married, you come to the wife to get separated. <laughs> but so the, the wife was, mother is telling me that she's in Canada. So sometimes people come for such reasons that can, they want to get separated. So one woman came and she said, why do you want to be separated? Why do you want to separate him? He says, because he says, my husband and I, we cannot agree on the temperature of the AC in our home. <laughs> now, well, that's a common problem I was told for families. But you know, is that something worth getting separated about? There are so many people who don't have ACs in their homes. There are so many people who don't even have homes. Isn't it? But now her reasoning was. You know, you know, I got married at the age of 31, she said. I was waiting and waiting to find my dream partner. And he said, if he's my dream partner, if he's what they call my Mr. Right, then our body temperature should be synchronized. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is an unrealistic expectation. The point I'm making over here is, if we expect that there should be no distress in my life, then even a small distress will become very big. But if we accept that whatever is going to happen, some distress will always be there. Then we accept that, and then we focus on something bigger in our life. So, I said that I'm going to talk about the teachings of the Gita in terms of an acronym ACT. So the first part of it is A, accept that distress is unavoidable. Stop trying to, stop making our life's purpose removing distress. If we are trying to, then what do we do? Like if we go to the Himalayas, we have a higher purpose. Okay, I want to get to the peaks. I want to behold these sights. So, we want to, we want to have a higher purpose to our lives. So Krishna is telling Arjuna in the context of the Gita, that distress is going to be unavoidable. You think that fighting and killing Bhishma and Drona is distressful? But if you don't fight, what is going to happen? Duryodhana is going to try to attack and kill your family, kill your allies. That is going to cause distress to you. Even if you can protect your allies and use will draw the forest, he will keep tormenting innocent people. That will cause distress to you. So distress is unavoidable in the world. Don't make decisions solely based on how can I avoid distress. So, attempting to run away from unhappiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness. Like addictions. And then what happens is, people have some problem. And they think, I'll just drink. And I'll get away from this unhappiness. So, basically running away from distress. It only leads to um, increasing our distress. It itself becomes the cause of greater distress. This of course does not mean that we have to stray forever in distress. Like if in the Himalayas, it is not that we have to live without wearing warm clothes. We can wear warm clothes. But some cold will come in and tolerate it. So when Krishna is saying Dukkha Leha Krishna is telling basically that don't try to avoid distress. Don't make your decisions based on what will cause minimum distress. So then what do we do? So that is the C and T which we'll be talking about later. But the idea is that we cultivate a purpose that makes distress bearable. A, not just a purpose, a meaningful purpose that, like I gave the, the example, when people have a child, they lose their sleep, but then taking care of a child, bringing a new form, life form into the world, life into the world, that is profoundly meaningful. So cultivate a meaningful purpose, a purpose that is meaningful enough to make the distress bearable. And that purpose, 
well there can be many purposes that purpose krishna says ultimately is devotional service service to the lord we'll come to these points a little later but when we understand that god is the well wisher of everyone and god wants me to be an instrument in doing good in the world god wants me to become a part of his plan then each one of us can have a purpose this point of purpose we'll discuss when we come to the 18th chapter chapter once again and that then we'll discuss the 18th chapter rather we'll come to the tea part also later but essentially the gita is not a message of pessimism that's the second point from this 8th chapter now we i'll go quickly to the 9th chapter now in 9th 9th chapter krishna talks of many things but the focus is now krishna has said that bhakti yoga is easier, easier than ashtanga then he gives four characteristics of bhakti yoga why is it easier why is it better he <coughs> so these four characters are basically from the ninth chapter 20th verse to 33rd verse so krishna says that this is it's e a s e s e e is eternal it gives results that are eternal krishna says all other paths they give you temporary results you'll go to heavens but you'll come back again when you practice bhakti you come to me and you stay eternally with me this is basically a comparison from 20 to 22 ananya chintayanto ma whatever you practice it will always stay with me then he says it is accessible accessible for everyone that is everybody can practice it this he talks especially in 31 32 words or rather 32 33 he says that mami parta vyapashitya ye pisyu papalne anyone and everyone can practice bhakti many other spiritual paths they say that you have been born in a particular a particular uh, uh, caste or you have to renounce the world before you can practice the spirituality but bhakti is anyone everyone it's accessible to everyone then he says it's simple that's what he says in 26 27 patram pushpam phalam to yam yo me bhakti aprayachati that you don't need a lot of wealth and power and expertise to practice bhakti just whatever devotion is in the heart you express that devotion in whatever we can even we offer the lord one flower in a devotional mood the lord accepts our devotion so bhakti is uh, a bhakti is simple and when it, when you say it is simple what it means is it does not require complicated skills or complicated paraphernalia it can be simply practiced by anyone and everyone and lastly it is elevating elevating means that even if a person has done something wrong even if a person has done something sinful krishna doesn't reject that person apichet sudracharo bhajate mam ananya even if you have done something sinful krishna says if you want to practice bhakti i won't reject you i won't reject you i will be with you there is in the vishnu sahasrana a very beautiful uh, description that nimisha nimisho nimisha swagri vachas patirudaradhi so nimisha and animisha now these two words they have many different meanings madhacharya says that each word each of the names of the vishnu sahasrana one word one name can have a thousand meanings but baldev vidya bhushan gives certain meanings so he says that nimisha means one who blinks his eyes one who animisha means one who never blinks his eyes so what does it mean that if we are trying to serve the lord and we commit some mistakes the lord blinks the eyes and overlooks the mistakes 
So the, on the other hand, if we are doing a service, even if we do the smallest service, the Lord notes that service with unblinking eyes. With unblinking eyes. That is his mercifulness. So earn Misha, who never blinks eyes. An example for this is that we consider Putana. She came to kill Krishna. Now her motive was wrong, but she still offered her breast milk. So Krishna closed his eyes. He overlooked his mo her motive and he elevated and liberated her. Aho bakiyam is the kala He elevated and liberated her. And on the other hand, if we consider Draupadi, at one time Krishna was at Pandava's place and Krishna and Arjuna were talking, so Draupadi came over there, she offered him some fruits and they had some intimate discussions, so Draupadi started walking away. So Krishna took the knife and started peeling the fruits. When he was peeling, the knife slipped from his hand and his finger got cut. And the finger got cut, Draupadi noticed she came running back, she pulled off a part of her silk sari and immediately started bandaging Krishna. And she abandoned Krishna. She was in anxiety, but Krishna was pleased and smiling. He says, Oh, Panchali, he says, I will remember this service that you are rendered to me. And then he remembered and rewarded that service. When did he reward? Vastraharana. Yes, in the Vastraharan. She offered a small part of her sari, and Krishna gave her unlimited robes. So, such is the Lord. That even if we do a small service, he never forgets that service. And that's why the Gita says that. Krishna says, yes, this world is Dukkhalim, that, that you have attained this Dukkhalim world, Bajaswama, Anityama Sukham Lokam, Imam Prabhupi Bajaswama. That this Lord, whatever little we do for him, he, he loves us, He cares for us, He wants to elevate us. The Lord is present in our hearts. And He is there in our hearts, He is watching, He is the witness. And He is witness not to catch us when we do wrong. That is not His purpose. It is it's not like a policeman who is just waiting for someone to commit a crime. Like in some of the big cities in the western world, the police want to earn, the government wants to earn through, they can't earn through fines, they, taxes they earn through fines. So anybody goes a little bit above the speed limit, the police come immediately give tickets. They are waiting to catch a person doing wrong. But Krishna is there, catch us when we fall. He is like a mother. When a small child is learning to walk, the mother is watching with a hawk's eye. And she is pleased with every step that the baby takes, that the toddler takes. And as soon as the toddler starts falling, the mother swoops in to catch hold of the child. So Krishna is like that. Krishna is watching us, but he is on our side. He's not against us. He's not watching us to punish us when we do wrong. He is watching us to help us grow, to protect us and elevate us. Such is the Lord's love for us. And it is that Lord who we can connect with through the practice of Bhakti Yoga. So we will continue in our next session about the chapters 10, 11 and 12 I'll take in the evening and then we will have our journaling based on the Bhagavad Gita. So I'll quickly summarize what we discussed today. So we discussed chapters 7 to, 7 to 9 we discussed today. So the first point I discussed was how the Gita is a natural conversation. Hmm? That means it's not a structured conversation. It's not exactly like a structured course. So as the subjects come up, the Gita addresses those subjects. And from the theme of detachment, being detached that was there, from there the Gita comes to fixing the mind of the Lord and now 7.1 till 12.20. How to make the mind attached? That's the focus. So we discussed that here the process by which we can make the mind attached. That's what was discussed from 7.1 onwards.
So now the second point I discussed was based on 716 to 19 that how the journey of spiritual growth happens. Initially, God is like the the world is a big reality and God is the small reality. But eventually what happens? The world becomes the small reality, God becomes the bigger reality. So we may spiritual, practice spiritual growth initially as a shock absorber but eventually it becomes a gold transformer. That we First here, God is like the last alternative for us. Like a boy comes to a girl because nobody else is to marry, ready to marry her. But then the boy becomes committed to the girl. That is like God becomes our first alternative. That is Bhavnam Janmanam Nanti. Then based on chapter 8 we discussed how Krishna has explained Bhakti Yoga is better than Dhyan Yoga. Why? Because with respect to meditation, the object of meditation in Bhakti Yoga, it is active and attractive. So Krishna is himself attractive and Krishna is active in terms of giving mercy. In Dhyan Yoga, it is passive. We are focusing on some point externally, some object visualized. So it's much easier in Bhakti Yoga. Then, we talked about that, is the Gita pessimistic? This was what I spent the maximum time on. I discussed from the contextual, text, contextual that Arjuna is in distress, the Gita does not say stay in distress. It removes his distress. Textual, that is just one fourth of one verse. And the point is, you can go beyond distress. And the philosophical is, we discussed how there are four worlds, this world and the other world. And we discussed four philosophies. Materialism, Nihilism, Impersonalism, and then the devotional Gita worldview. So this is the most life affirming. And the Gita says that when stop avoiding distress, focus on cultivating a meaningful purpose, and then distress will become minimal. And then ninth chapter discuss two points, uh, uh, or rather, I focused on one point from the ninth chapter, that is the acronym, how the glory of Bhakti Yoga is. What was E as E was? Sorry? It offers eternal results. A was? It is accessible for everyone. S was? Simple. Anybody can practice, just offer. And e was? Elevating. So here especially we discussed how Krishna he is unblinking and blinking. So if you're doing service, he unblinkingly notices. And if he makes a mistake, he just blinks and overlooks the mistakes. So Krishna is, he's watching, but he's watching for our good, for our elevation. He's like a mother who is watching when the child falls, not to laugh at the child when the child falls, not to punish the child when the child falls, but to Catch the child and raise the child. Such is the love of the Lord for all of us. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So we have gone a little over time now. Yeah, the next session is at 4 o'clock. So, Preacher Tanipo is here. Karanku, you have any comments? Yeah, the the four aspects of the philosophical element in the ninth chapter which you explained I think is very very crucial and today's reality is 80% of spiritual practitioners in India are more or less in the impersonal category and uh, one of Srila Prabhupada's um, the Pranamantra says Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Constitutional Desha It basically caters to two of those, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and what, okay, okay, I just don't know. Okay. Materialism, so all three are covered. Okay, that's brilliant. <laughs> and we've been giving Bhakti to all. So now the biggest challenge is how ISKCON and with all of Srila Prabhupada's statements. 
uh, against all of these other philosophical thoughts. How to integrate? Because on a philosophical level, for our at a practitioner level, we are totally absorbed in our bhakti. Mm. But at a social political level, the narratives which we have set, and especially with our founder coming out in the open with statements, makes things very difficult for any potential collaborations. And even if we make attempts at collaboration, it is, it is many times misunderstood by the practitioners because of the stand which has been taken. So moving forward, you know, to run an organization, to run an, run an institution, yeah. Srila Prabhupada always said you need land, capital, labor, money, mm. political cloud. So that's a very important, uh, you know, confusion which we need to resolve at some point of time as an institution. And uh, another problem is everything is in the public domain. Prabhupada's books are in public, that's fine. But why the conversations and why the private discussions have been made public? Yeah. So that creates that's many, true. many uh, embarrassing, challenging uh, situations for his leadership that's when we are trying to collaborate. No, that's true, definitely. And it is a challenge. I'll just make two points so you can reflect on that. Prabhupada himself was that way and nuanced. Like when Prabhupada met Dr. Patel, uh, not Dr. Mishra, who was at his Mishra Yadava studio, he met him later. Yurajma also mentions this times that Prabhupada had a very, he came after his tongue was established and they had a very <coughs> nice conversation. They had lunch together. And then you would ask him, Prabhupada, we, we thought that this Mishra is an impersonalist. And Prabhupada said, yes, philosophically we argue like anything, but culturally we are friends. So it's like if we consider a person, you know, an individual or an organization, often their philosophy is only one part of their identity. There could be culture would be there, their humanitarian work could be there, mm -hmm. their national affiliation could be there. Their, their educational work could be there. So, there are so many different aspects to people. In fact, you know, we may condemn Mayavad, but we have a very Mayavadi view of all of reality other than his own. That means, everything is one. That people, uh, while Prabhupada has made those statements, but Prabhupada has also nuanced his approach. It was not that uh, George Harrison, he made so many impersonal statements in Prabhupada's presence. If you look at the conversation with Prabhupada and George Harrison, Prabhupada says that, Jaga says this, this Swami says this, and this Swami says that. Prabhupada doesn't go on a mission refuting all of them. Prabhupada just focuses on talking about bhakti. So it's not that, so my point is that, yes, philosophically we don't have to compromise. But for many people, philosophy is only a small part of their identity. Most another important point is, most of the life members who helped Prabhupada, they were already initiated disciples of many Mayavadi Gurus. And I talked with Giraj Maharaj about this. He said that when he went to their homes, they had big pictures of these Mayavadi Gurus in their homes. When Prabhupada would go to their home, Prabhupada hardly comment on that. Prabhupada engaged them in service. So basically, he used not their philosophical affiliation, but their, you could say, nationalist cultural pride. Oh, this Swami from India has made Western people to disciples. No one has So Prabhupada is an expert in engaging people. Yes, Prabhupada's statements are there. At the same time, I feel that if we, the way we conduct ourselves, we represent ourselves, then that can have a significant impact. So while confronting at a philosophical level where it's required, it's also important that we don't reduce people to their philosophical belief. Because we ourselves say that an individual is more than their head, isn't it? The heart is the most important thing. So, this one Sadhana Man was, I was asking him this question, Sadhana Man was telling me that he's one of these life members who helped Prabhupada. He went to meet him when uh, he was in his last days. And he says he was so weak and initiated. But when I saw him, uh, he just, he just with so much enthusiasm started glorifying Prabhupada. And he said, I was talking with him, I was thinking 
that when this person departs, what is Krishna going to see? Is Krishna going to see that this person was initiated by a Mayavadi Guru? Or is Krishna going to see that this person served my pure my pure devotee Prabhupada so much and has so much love for Prabhupada? This is Krishna is Bhavagrahi. So what has happened is more than the statement that Prabhupada has made, it's like some statements of Prabhupada, some actions of Prabhupada uh, have been highlighted and we reduce Prabhupada only to those statements. So in Prabhupada's statements only and Prabhupada's example, there are alternative examples also. So at a cultural level, at a national level, we can definitely collaborate. But it's a challenge. No doubts too. Thank you. Hare Krishna. So we'll have question answers later in tomorrow. So I'll tell our plan now. So in the next session, I'll be covering chapters 10, 11, 12 in the first half. And the second half, we'll have journaling. Then tomorrow, in the first half, we'll be covering chapters 13 to around first half of 18 or 17. And then the last 10, 12 verses, they're very, from 63 to 78 to 16 verses, they're very devotionally surcharged. And we will talk that in our second session tomorrow morning. And the last session tomorrow evening, we'll have specifically question answers. And if there are no questions, then we'll have a second journaling session at that time also. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki, Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta ki, Thank you Prabhu, for Thakran Bhakti. Shri Tanasharan Prabhu ki, Jai.